It is with great pleasure that I introduce our next guest in the waiting room, a person that will be readily familiar to so many of us who sit at home, an award-winning journalist who has presented on Radio Live, on BBC News, and has won multiple awards, including a BAFTA award for her work and her empathetic, pragmatic, and direct approach in revealing those most important stories to us, and perhaps more revealing getting people comfortable enough to be able to share the most intimate parts of their stories with us. I have the very great pleasure of introducing Victoria Derbyshire. Good morning, Victoria. Hello. That's such a build-up. I, I just feel I'm going to disappoint you, but thank you so much for being so kind. I suppose your story starts with telling us about your parents. Can we start with your mum? Yes, of course. So my mum is brilliant. Um, She's a fantastic mum. She's very petite. She's very ladylike. I'm not really like that. Um, She had me, I'm the oldest, and then my brother two years later and my sister two years after that. We're very, very close-knit. She, when we were growing up, she was very loving very encouraging. You know, I remember after school, pretty much every day of the week, there would be some activity that she was taking us to, whether it was swimming or drama or gymnastics or karate. She was forever running us around to to have those kind of opportunities. I remember us going out, it's certainly in the summer holidays, we would be out all day and we would come back for tea at six o'clock, seven o'clock. She was really chilled about stuff like that. I think that was good for encouraging independence. Um, and we could have a real laugh with her. You know, she's... She's, I, we, obviously we don't live together now. She's in Bolton, I'm in London. We speak regularly on the phone. We're very, very close. Um, she, she's the reason that I'm the kind of person that I am today. She didn't have much support from, from her husband, from my uh, father. So she just, I think she would say she kind of muddled through. But the key thing is she just loved us. And, and clearly... As an adult, I can see how important that is. Absolutely. You've got a very beautiful and elegant full name. Can you tell us that? And there's also a story behind your middle name. So my full name is Victoria Antoinette Derbyshire. My middle name is Antoinette. um, And my mum told me that she wanted it to be Antoinette because my father was called Anthony. And she... He hadn't really been involved in her pregnancy, she told me, particularly. Um, It was his first child. It was her first child. It was their first child. And she thought that would be a way of of helping me and him bond. She thought it would be a lovely thing to do, which it was. Um, He he wasn't there for the birth, so she thought that that would be a good thing to do. Sure. It didn't work. (laughs) No, and unfortunately, you know, this puts us into this part of your childhood and I know you've worked really hard to just put a close on this part of your life but tell me a little bit about your biological father and what he was like. So my father was not how a father should be. He was violent, he was aggressive, he was always starting arguments, he was, uh, he treated my mum very poorly physically and emotionally, Uh, he treated his children poorly, he would hit us, he would um, you know, use his belt to hit us. He would hit us with his hands. Um, he was, he, it was just tense when he was around. You know, he would put his key in the front door coming home from work and we would scatter in the house. We just didn't want to be in the kitchen. You know, the kitchen in every house is the kind of centre of a household, isn't it? Yeah. So we would scatter up to our bedrooms or go out to play. Um, so, yeah, he was, he was not a good father. And as much as your mum must have been a calming influence and just the person that you wanted to be around, when your father came, your biological father, can you just try and describe for us the changes that would go through you and the changes with your siblings? We would go quiet because we didn't want to be in a position where we said anything that would provoke a reaction from him. Now, it's mad, isn't it? A 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, a 6-year-old, you can pretty much say what you want. You know, we weren't bad kids. Uh, and, and actually, we just, uh, you know, I realised as I was growing up, it didn't matter what you said. Anything could be used as an excuse to hit you or cause an argument or keep you up late, you know, when you were desperate to go to bed because you had school the next day. Mm. 
to keep going over and over some minor misdemeanor, whether it was, you know, not putting our bike in the right place or there was a mark on the wall. Um, so, so basically we would go quiet. I remember we used to have Sunday lunch every Sunday. My mum would cook a roast, um, and every Sunday we'd be tense because there'd always be an argument that he would start. Um, and, you know, I remember one occasion where literally we were having, I don't know what the pudding was, it was apple pie and custard, something like that. And my mum was pouring the custard and she let some of the skin from the custard go on the pudding. And he went mad. We've been married for decades. How do you not know that I don't like the skin on the custard? I mean, it's hilarious, actually, when you think about it. Yeah. And there was, we did have a lot of black humour. And that caused a big row, and me and my brother and sister were kicking each other under the table, like, oh, here we go again, you know. It was just, it was just so boring and wearing. And, but that became the norm, and you got used to it. Your mum, unfortunately, suffered physical abuse at the hands of your biological father, and unfortunately, there will be men and women waking up now, living that reality. Mm. And so for their benefit, can you just tell us some of the things that she had to unfortunately experience and that you saw as a child mm. growing up? Um, I mean, I remember regularly sitting at the top of the stairs late at night, hearing a huge row between him and her, and then you would hear my mum scream out or cry because he'd hit her or he'd thrown a pan at her. Once she had a, a you know, she had a cut on her head. Um, there was a time when she had to go to the GPs because she had pain in her ribs and she had broken ribs. Um, once he locked her in the bedroom and was, I could hear that he was hitting her and she was crying out and uh, I was scared and I thought he, I thought he might kill her and I was 12 or 13. We didn't have a, the, we had, the landline had been cut off because he didn't pay the bill. Um, and now what I've learned so much more about domestic abuse, maybe that was another way of isolating us from f friends and family. So I decided I was going to run to the police station, which was a couple of miles down the road. So I did. Um, ran in, scared, and just said, you've got to come, my, my dad's hitting my mum. So those were some of the things that she went through. You yourself, unfortunately, suffered uh, abuse, be it emotional, physical. Yeah. Um, and can you share with us a little bit about what you had to experience? Yeah. Often I would remember I'd be asleep. I was obviously going to school the next day. My bedroom door would bang open. It would smash against the bedside lamp. It would fall off the table. The big light would be switched on. Suddenly there was bright lights in the bedroom. There'd be something that he had to accuse me of. God knows what. Sometimes he dragged me out of bed and chucked me across the bathroom floor. I mean, it just it's just so cruel, isn't it? Even just saying this stuff is vile. Was there ever an instance where you had an awful time at home or you were experiencing awful things at home and yet you had to put on a brave face at school? Or was school your escape? How did it sort of work for you? I never felt I had to put on a brave face. Um, I just went to school. Um, primary school, me, my brother and my sister all went to the same primary school and my mum was a teacher there. Mm. So I used to love when we'd all get in the car in the morning, all together, four of us as a unit, listen to whatever we'd listen to. Back in those days, we had a you know cassette player in the car. We'd listen to Wings and Harry Nielsen and stuff like that. We'd know all the words, we'd ABBA, we'd sing along. And that was a really happy time. Mm. And we'd go to school. We loved school, it was safe, we had friends, it was fun. Our mum was literally on site, you know. Um, so that was always a kind of joyous, hooray, we're in the car together, safe, you know, going off to school. And you clearly flourished at school and you loved being there. Mm. And during your time there, where did this idea and this passion of maybe exploring journalism or, or anything else, where did that sort of develop? Actually, that was way later. That was actually at university. So I'd always written a diary since I was about eight or nine. Nine it was. Um, so I, I obviously, and again, I haven't realised this till I'm an adult. I used to like to write down what had happened or, you know, what, what, what party you'd been to or what I'd worn that day or whatever, or what stupid thing someone at school had said. Um, and it was only when I was at uni when I, I thought, oh, I'd, I'd really like to write for the university newspaper, and I, which I did. It was just cinema reviews, book reviews, or, you know, I got to interview an actress once at the Everyman Theatre, which was great. Um, I didn't think I was that great at writing. Um, and so I thought, well, is there another way to do this? And then I started to research and realised that you could be a radio journalist or a TV journalist. So that's where that kind of came from. And then I thought, oh, I want to do something about it. So I got in touch with Toxteth Community Radio when I was at, I was at Liverpool University, obviously, um, and said, you know, I know it's mad, but, you know, could I do 
do some news for you or do a news bulletin or so I went to meet these guys in Toxteth and they ran a pirate radio station from their back bedroom and we had a chat and it was I mean it's bizarre when I think about it now and every Sunday I would go there and do kind of the news of the week in Liverpool uh so yeah that's that's where that started you know You've got an intriguing life in a sense because you, you know, work in the glamorous world of presenting news. Can you give us a sense of what your daily routine is like? I go in several days a week and I'm um, covering the news at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, which involves obviously delivering the news, interviewing people about what's happened. Um, so I get up at quarter past four in the morning, um, get, get into work, either driving or in a taxi. Go through all the papers, then read the briefs that have been sent to me overnight for various guests. Think of new ideas. What guests can we chase this morning? Um, then, so, so I'm in usually about five. Then about half seven, I will uh, go and put some makeup on because we don't have um, makeup artists in uh, because of coronavirus. And then, and I'm always listening to the radio and what, you know, watching bits of TV to see what else, so I don't miss anything. And then go into the studio at about half past eight and get the microphone on and the kit on and yeah, start at 9am. And along all of this journey and along all the things that you've done, 2015 was a seminal moment. Um, and can you just tell us about the experiences of that year? So that year was big in two ways. One, we just launched our new TV news programme, uh, which was called After Me, because we couldn't <laughs> think of a better name, uh, which was a brand new programme uh, where we would do stories that reflect the, or the lives of underserved audiences. So young people, uh, people from ethnic minorities, working class people. So that was a major thing. We worked so hard to get it off the ground. It was mega. Uh, and then three or four months after we launched, uh, I got a breast cancer diagnosis. So that was a big shock because I was 46 and, you know, as far as I was concerned, too young to have a, a diagnosis like that. So that uh, was a blow, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me about the moment that you, not even you were told breast cancer, but that you found the lump and just what went through your mind? It was a Sunday evening. And I looked in the mirror, I was just getting ready for bed, and my right breast seemed to be lower than the left one, maybe an inch, half an inch, an inch lower than the other side. And also, the nipple looked as though it was inverting, it was as though someone was pulling it back inside my body. So I just thought, oh, that's a bit weird, I'll sort that tomorrow. Uh, went to bed, didn't, wasn't worried, just, you know, got up early, um, waiting to go to work and just thought, oh, I'll just Google inverted nipple and various things came up, uh, you know, breastfeeding, I can't remember what else, blah, blah, blah. But one of them was breast cancer. And, and that's the thing when I was, so, you know, scrolling down, that's the thing, that's where I stopped. Because I thought, well, it's not, it's not the other things. Oh my God, it might be breast cancer. Um, and I, I couldn't, couldn't deal with it in my head and loads of things went through my head. I immediately emailed my husband, Mark. He wasn't my husband then. He was asleep upstairs and I just quit two line before I left. Darling, I think I need an emergency appointment at the GPs. Please, could you make that for me today? Um, I didn't mention the word cancer, just, you know, trying to be low key. Um, um, yeah, and then I went to work. Um, I went to the GPs that afternoon. The boys came with me. They were how old were they? Eight and eleven then. It was the summer holiday, so they had to come with me. Um, GP did a really swift examination, not in front of the children, um, and said, I'm referring you for a, an emergency appointment at the hospital. And then, you know, that, then you think, OK, I know what's coming. You know, I know. He didn't, again, he didn't say the words. And I, had, I know I had tears in my eyes. Mark came back from work that night. We could barely speak because we knew the significance of it. I remember we, we sat outside and we had a glass of wine. We could, but we, 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 you know, we could barely talk about it because it's too massive to get your head round. Um, the next day I told my editor, my best friend, again after the programme, I said the reason I've been so quiet for 24 hours is because I think I might have breast cancer and she was shocked. Um, 
And I said, you know, I've got a, this emergency appointment with a consultant in a couple of weeks. She said, well, can you wait a couple of weeks? I actually thought two weeks was quite quick. She said, why don't you go privately around the corner at Harley Street? I said, because well, two weeks is all right. But once she'd planted that seed, I thought, OK, I'm going to get on with this. So, so Wednesday, I went there for an appointment. They referred me to a whatever you call the person who does this, a scan that day. Uh, he found something on the scan. Uh, he said, we could do a biopsy now. We could take the tissue now, so, or you can think about it. I said, well, you may as well take it now. By the Friday, I went back to get the results of the biopsy, and that's when the GP said, um, it is malignant. Yeah, I just knew, I knew. There was no other explanation. And so it's a massive shock. Even so, to hear the words, you know, um, obviously Mark was with me. Um, I just thought, oh God, you know, my luck's run out. Um, I didn't cry, I didn't, you know, I just sort of absorbed it all. And then I was immediately in, okay, questions, I need to ask questions. What does this mean? When can I see a consultant? Is it treatable? None of these questions, obviously, she could answer, but you just ask them anyway. Um, but I knew I had the consultant's appointment a week after. So, yeah, it was just, it was just, it was awful. It was horrible. And then we got outside. It was a gorgeous summer's day. It was the end of July, 2015. We went into this square and then I cried. I, you know, I cried into Mark's shoulder and he was hugging me. And, uh, um, and then I was really cross. And then I was like, oh my God, I haven't got time to have cancer. You know, I've just launched this program and I'm busy and we've got kids and we've got a nice life and our friends and family, da, 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 you know. Um, yeah. I know it can sound so unusual in the grand scheme of things, but, you know, life still has to carry on and you've got work and yeah. you've got children, you had your partner mm. and almost it can always, almost be seen as a nuisance. You know, why now and why has this yeah. happened? I mean, I never thought, I never, I never thought, why me? And, and I, I suppose I never thought, why now? It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it was it was an education to, to realise that a 46-year-old could be diagnosed with breast cancer. And then obviously you read more, you, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not massively touched my life. Yes. So when it does, then you read more about it and then you read, uh, you know, yeah, I can, I, I'm, I, you know, it was still is relatively early for someone being diagnosed with breast cancer. But it's possible that people in their 40s get breast cancer and in their 30s and in their 20s. I discovered. Absolutely. You've got two children, haven't you? Oh, what, what are their names? Oliver is now 16 and Joe is 13. Oliver and Joe. Did you have conversations with them? I, I imagine you would have with, with Mark and perhaps your mum. How do you have those conversations? We didn't tell our children until we knew it was treatable. Because, as you know, there's a diagnosis and then there are weeks and weeks of tests. Uh, has it spread? Has it gone to the other breast? Is it treatable? What is the treatment? What's, you know, how can we, how can we help you from the NHS's point of view? When we knew it was treatable, that's when we told the children. Um, because we, 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 talk, we talk about things, we're open in our family, there aren't, you know, hopefully there are no secrets. Um, but they're only 8 and 11, so you don't want to burden them with too much information but you want to be honest about what the the path ahead is so it was when we'd come that they used to come with us come with me to the hospital because wow. i wanted them to see that hospitals are bright and people are lovely and it's not a place to be scared of so it was all part of their summer holiday routine at that point which i was glad about because you know they met radiologists and consultants and guess what they're really nice people you know and they're there to help you one thing that you've described is you you when you came around with the diagnosis was my, my luck has run out. Mm. In real terms, what did that mean for you, for you and for your family? I mean, initially I thought I was going to die. Um, and maybe that's the emotion that everybody has when, they, when they're told they have cancer. Yeah, I thought I was going to die. And I, was, I didn't want to, and it would have been rubbish if I died. <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to grow old with Mark. I wanted, I wanted to see my children grow up. I wanted to spend even more brilliant occasions with my family and my close friends. Yeah, I thought that was it. Yeah. And tell me about some of the treatment that you then did go on to have. Um, I had a mastectomy. 
and then I had six cycles of chemotherapy and I had 30 doses of radiotherapy. It sounds like a lot, that, doesn't it? But it, obviously, it, it's over a period of time. And you, my way of dealing with the length of time it was going to take was, OK, let's do each bit at a time. So let's, let's get through the surgery, which, you know, according to the consultant, went well. I felt amazing when I came around from surgery. I was very anxious going into it. I was worried more about the anaesthetic, to be fair. I did want to wake up, you know. Um, I felt brilliant after, after the the mastectomy because A, I was still on morphine and B, the cancer was out of me. It was like that, that was the major part of the treatment. The cancer's out. You know, I had to wait to see if it had gone into the lymph nodes. Um, so that took a bit of time. But broadly speaking, I felt amazing. I was euphoric. I felt on a high. I felt invincible. The, you know, the staff were brilliant. They were sensible and expert and skilled and compassionate and kind and I love them still um, so that was the first bit then there was the chemotherapy um, again we, we you know I did a lot of reading and a lot of preparation went to meet the chemo nurse went into the ward took the boys in because chemotherapy again is a frightening phrase um, went through the chemo that was you know, it started off okay, it gets progressively harder, the, you know, it's sort of the cumulative effects of chemotherapy. My hair started to fall out, that was awful. I'd prepared, I'd had a wig made. I knew I wanted to keep working as much as I could, so I'd have to wear a wig on TV. That was really stressful, and then it wasn't. Um, chemo got hard halfway through when it switched from one drug to another, really made me feel like an old woman. Um, but when that was over again, another massive high, you know, and then people had said to me, radiotherapy is a breeze compared to chemo. So I was cool with that. Um, yeah. And then from start to finish, it was 301 days. And by the time it was over, God, it was amazing. It was like, wow, I've got through this, you know, I've done it. My family's amazing. They stepped up. My friends did. And honestly, I felt invincible. It's bizarre to say it. I thought, God, if I can do that, I can literally do anything. And I already thought I was a strong person before I got cancer. Absolutely. So imagine how much stronger <laughs> I felt getting through that, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. Um, you're a public figure, um, and this is an intensely private thing that's happened. You can have surgery and someone may not even know it. Mm. But you go through chemotherapy, and as happened to you, it changes you. And there are changes that sometimes you just can't hide. So can you tell us about that, and particularly with losing your hair? Now, people who have chemotherapy, some people are worried about the nausea, some people are worried about the tiredness, but a huge part of it is losing your hair. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the side effects from chemo for me were that initial feeling of actually feeling hungover. That's how it felt to me after, immediately after chemo, so in the hours after... It was, it was like a hangover, a headache, being really knackered, wanting to eat loads of, you know, carbohydrates. Um, and, and, and it would knock you out. So you, I would sleep for, for me, I slept, you know, certainly in the early stages for a good few days afterwards. And then, and then I would start to get some energy back after about a week. And then I would go back to work for a couple of weeks before the next session, because it was every three weeks. And after the first one or two, I thought, oh my God, my hair's not falling out. And I was wearing the cold cap. Yeah. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm one of the ones where the cold cut works, you know. And then after the third one, when I washed my hair, it started to come out. And I thought, okay, I haven't, I haven't got away with this. Um, so yeah, it was just, it, it, you know, when you, it's not, it, it's not a vanity thing. But when you look in the mirror, you are you. You know, I've always had long hair. That is, it's part of your identity, and it's, it's the most. Um, obvious manifestation of being a cancer patient actually and I didn't I didn't want people to feel sorry for me I didn't want people to look at me and go oh look she's lost her hair you know she's going through I didn't want that and I still wanted to do my job I know some people shave their hair off actually and it gives them a, a feeling of empowerment I, I couldn't I didn't want to do that I didn't want to wear a scarf on TV. I didn't want to be bald on TV because it would distract from the guests that we were doing or the interviews that I was doing. So that's why I went down the let's have a wig made route. Um, but losing my hair was harder than losing a breast. Mm -hmm. And 
and, and, and some people who've been through cancer will totally get that. Others won't, and that's fine, but it's how I felt. It, it doesn't mean it's the same for everyone. It's, it's just how I felt. Because it's, because it's part of your identity, and people see it, and you see it every day. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was stressful. What was that moment like when you had your last dose of radiotherapy? It was 2016, and I was... The day after my last dose of radiotherapy, I was flying to Glasgow to do a BBC One debate on the EU referendum for yeah. under 30s. That's how long ago it was. Um, and so they, at, at Guildford, where I was having my um, radiotherapy, they said, I said, look, is there any way of just bringing it forward really early in the morning? Because I've got to get on a plane. Mm. Um, so they did, which was fantastic. So I had my last radiotherapy at something like eight o'clock in the morning. Um, took loads of presents for everyone. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, and had it, did it, left the hospital, walked out. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. I felt so happy. I was on a total high. I was really emotional. Because um, it was over, you know? It was over, and I'd got through it, and I'd done it, and I was alive, and... I was going to work and all the normal things that in my life were suddenly back, you know. Um, yeah, it was incredible. It's such an amazing feeling. And do you think it changes you? Does it change you as a person, your outlook? For me, definitely. Um, I, only in that, you know, it was so profound, the whole experience. and you. You think, okay, so, I mean, I did think I lived life to the full before I had cancer, I've got to say. But it was, you know, it was tenfold afterwards. Life is short, you don't know what's around the next corner, you don't know what's going to happen. You've got to grab experiences, you've got to do stuff, you've got to say yes to stuff. You've got to live, you've got to live, because you don't know how much time you've got. Um, so I think, yeah, it just kind of... I doubled down on that life is short feeling. And what, where have you been left with in terms of your, your breast cancer and your treatment? You know, what, you know are you a, a cured? Are you in remission? Um, no one's ever said that to me. I'm cool with that. Um, I've passed the five year mark, which is a significant milestone for anyone who has had cancer. And what would you say about the NHS, about all the people who have been on this journey with you? Oh, God, I could say so much. It makes me want to cry. Um, I mean, I could say the NHS. I could say, you know, the chemo nurses. I could say the breast cancer nurse, Utra. I could say my consultant, Mr. Qatari. I could, I could name so many people from all over the world who came to work in the NHS who... who oh god who saved my life you know it's really it sounds dramatic to say it like that but they did and they knew what they were doing i felt totally in safe hands they were skilled and compassionate and experts in their field and kind and they hugged me and i hugged them and they were cool if i needed a hug and they made me laugh and um I'm still in touch with them now. I mean, they were just absolutely magnificent, you know, absolutely stepped up and were amazing. And I'm so grateful. And before we finish, there's a few other people who want to say something to you from the waiting room. So when you're ready. Okay, gosh, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm sure you weren't expecting this, um, <laughs> but I just wanted to say, we all are, but me specifically, <laughs> I'm a superior child um, of you, we were in the last five, six years, however long it's been, it's been a long time, um, and the way that you carried yourself and through that whole thing was unbelievable. I, I don't get how you can go through that and still carry on with your job, still be one of the best mums I've ever met, I'm joking, you're the best mum. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Hi, Marie. I just wanted to say, uh, from the point of view 
of a superior child, how <laughs> proud and impressed with how brave you were. And looking back on the 2015 into 2016 time, how, how unworried I was. Mm -hmm. And that is entirely credit to you. How I just thought, yeah, it's just like a long, a long flu, which you'll definitely recover from. I have full faith you're always going to recover from it because you always made it so clear, or made you you appear so composed to all of us. Apart from obviously, no wonder we're all fat gay. But I, I have full faith you would get through it, and I'm immensely impressed and proud of you. Love you, mummy. Oh God, that's gorgeous. Oh. I have to thank Mark because oh. he was a big help. Oh, uh, thank you. You're so that. nice. And they I are mean, both gorgeous. I mean, I know, uh, you know, we say I love you a lot in our house, all of us, but I would, I would, I would never ask them, so what, you know, how was it then? What? So it's so lovely to actually hear them say that. Sorry, I'm really, I mean, emotional because it's so gorgeous and we're here and we're mm -hmm. alive and, and mm -hmm. thank, this you is for, exactly thank you for doing that. It's so gorgeous. Thank you all, very much. All, of and also they're it. funny and I really love that. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> hilarious. Um, thank you.